a um, few things. I'm gonna leave this up. I don't think it's pertinent uh, to this talk. Um, first of all, if you notice in the, the thing, gastric bypass is queen or king. Three talks on gastric bypass, two on sleeve, one on DS. So, uh, and I also wanna just point out that Pearl Ma is really an amazing, amazing surgeon. And when she says, we did this, or we decided to do that, it was her, and she is really incredible. And if any of you ever get the opportunity to go watch her, I've heard it's ridiculous, and she makes everybody else look kind of like average or less, so. Yes. <laughs> okay, so BPD, DS, Saudi, S. I'm going to actually take a different tack because um, I really don't have a lot of time to talk about all the issues, so I'm gonna run through some slides, but I wanna show you that um, we really shouldn't be afraid of DS and we shouldn't be afraid of SADI as if we're prepared, and uh, that many of the complications are gonna be similar between bypass and DS. So this is the most po uh, positive paper you're gonna find on uh, DS in comparison to uh, bypass, and it just came out. Ben Clapp has been really prolific and uh, looked at a lot of different things, and, and this is just one of the papers he's written, and you can see here that uh, bypass actually had higher rate of surgical site infection than BPDS, and they thought, so no difference of 30-day mortality, readmission, or reoperation. This is another one uh, looking at um, a recent paper looking at obviously BPDS bypass. So the 30-day complication rate was higher for BPDDS, but we're doing a lot more. And then um, but in the study, even for bypass and uh, sleeve, it was, it was not uh, very low. But so here's another study, it's a midterm now, looking at 92% follow-up, which is outrageously good um, for midterm. And what they found here is that we're gonna see what we expect, a lot of vitamin A and D issues, and that uh, the duodenal switch was also associated with more uh, GI adverse effects. And that also there was more reoperation, mostly due to malnutrition or diarrhea, which when I started doing, you know, I trained with Michelle Gagne back in the day, and um, I did DS, but I was worried about those patients because it was, it was hard to manage their diarrhea, it was hard to manage their, uh, mal uh, their vitamin D deficiencies, so I was also uh, worried about it. But here's um, data from Dr. Buchwald. They looked at, and sort of, if you wanna try and start doing it, um, giving you an idea of learning curve, they had, uh, um, uh, there were no deaths in either of their uh, groups between open and laparoscopic or robotic surgery. But they did have 30-day uh, complications, which we would expect, you know, similar things to what we see with bypass and sleeve. The interesting thing is that they did have um, uh, acute pancreatitis, which when we first started doing DS, we saw a lot of it, but the most recent papers really don't show that you're having a lot of pancreatitis with it. And the overall complication rate was definitely different if you did a BMI less than 50 or over 50, which I think is also applicable to what we do with bypass and sleeve. This is actually a study, uh, one of our former residents did this with us, and it was um, based on Dr. Renfielding's um, DS patients, and, uh, and we, she didn't have any 30-day mortalities, okay? There was one long-term um, uh, patient who, who died from severe malnutrition, so what we found in our, in our patients was that there was a lot of issues with the fat-soluble vitamins, that they had anemia, and uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism was very common. So another long-term study looking at uh, DS, and this is a lot more patients, over oh, close to 1,500, with almost 100% follow-up but in uh, lab evaluations. Most of the patients were really happy with their results. Operative mortality was about 1% in this group, and revision for malnutrition was 0.7. Total reversal was really low, 0.2. Um, but there was also, like you think it's gonna make all these people malnourished, there was reoperation for weight regain or insufficient weight loss here. That was at 1.5%. But again, same thing, deficiencies in vitamins um, uh, were present, but they felt that bone damage was very rare and severe anemia and severe deficiencies were, were not, and that they were able to treat the patients without permanent damage. So then if we look at primary versus second stage, so this is uh, patients that are going from um, uh, uh, doing the DS in one go versus sleeve and then doing a DS. There were no uh, short or long-term mortalities. They had 59 patients in each group. 
Um, and they found, though, that um, it was equivalent whether you had a single stage uh, DS or, or, or two stage DS, uh, they had the same number of complications at 5%. Um, I actually only do uh, the SADES now for revision patients from sleeve, and I you know, so my complication rates, uh, in, based on this study, is essentially the same as if I did it in one, one stage. So again, if you're going to do this and you do a two-stage, you're still going to see the issues that we, with, we see with our bleeding uh, with any surgery. Um, this one was very interesting. It's the first report I saw that they had duodenal ileal stenosis, and they had a fairly high number of patients have it. And the other thing is that when you do BPDS, you can uh, still get internal hernia, so you have to watch for that. Reoperation rate was higher after the second stage. So if we look at mid to long-term complications, um, here you saw that there was a 6.7% complication with clavian dindo greater than three. Mortality was 0.4% at 30 days and 09 at 90. And, um, but 80% of the patients, when they looked at them, at the 10-year mark had to uh, receive extra nutritional supplementation. And then this is a study looking at increasing the common channel. So when we first did, you know, the first lap DS, it was 100 centimeters, the common channel. And then people moved it to 150. Some people do that routinely, and other people are looking at So this is a study that looked at 100 versus 200. And as expected, 200 centimeter group had lower, lower incidence of protein malnutrition, hyperparathyroidism, and uh, also had improved uh, vitamin A and D levels, decreased bowel movements, which is important for the patient and also for you and your staff because you're going to have a lot of complaints um, if, if, it, if you can't get it controlled. But they also had more uh, weight regain. So that's the trade-off. You can do a longer length. You can go to 100 to what, well, really go to what, 150, and you'll have better um, management of the nutritional deficiencies. You can do this. Um, no comments on the what they're considering uh, elderly here, but anyway, age over 60 versus age less than 55, they matched the groups, and there was no difference in um, in major complications. So it's not age is not an issue. You can do it in older patients. I put this in here because um, it's actually a radiology study, and they looked at these 218 DS patients that they had studies on, and they found that, you know, even with um, DS, it's also bowel obstruction that we're worried about, and then they also saw ventral hernias and some anastomotic leaps, leaks, but only 2% required repeat operation. Doing a stump leak with a DS, very, pretty rare, not, not reported often. And so part of the issue when we're talking about revisions with sleeve and going to DS, we worry about the stump as we're dissecting it, but um, it, there's not a lot in the literature about it. So what are some of the revisions? What do people do for that? In this study, um, all the revisions were for protein malnutrition or diarrhea, metabolic abnormalities, liver disease. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit later. Um, but what they just did was go in and instead of um, dividing and moving it proximal, they just did a brawn above it and did a side to side with improvement in, in the patient's outcomes. So when you have to revise, it's not so, it's not so bad. You can go back and do a brawn. So um, here there was an, another group of 10 year outcomes for DS patients and just looking at um, what their outcomes were. Again, the issues were around vitamin A, D, uh, uh, anemia, and um, they also had some zinc issues, and we had um, still some reflux uh, issues discussed. And this was covered with the sleeve as well. So, so comparison of single versus uh, uh, standard DS, and early complications were similar between the two, uh, but the long-term were greater after a uh, full DS. And this is not a systemic review, but a systematic review. Anyway, 12 studies looking at SADES patients, and um, most of the time the common limb length was 300 centimeters, and a lot of the data supports that that's going to give you the least malnutrition. Diarrhea was the most common complication, and again, they also saw vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and also saw if you were checking the labs that the protein malnutrition was actually much higher than reported in some of the other papers I showed you, it could be up to 34%. So I routinely um, get labs on SADES and DS patients uh, twice a year, no matter what, no matter how long out from follow-up they are. And, and this is just another, there's, there's, all the papers are just talking about the complications rates. It's going to be less with a SADES than a standard DS. It's one less anastomosis. 
Uh, you can still get internal hernias from this. And um, again, if you have a longer, um, if you go to the 300 centimeter for the SADS, you're going to have less protein deficiency and, and um, uh, vitamin issues than if you did a standard DS as well. Okay, so this one, um, I'm going to skip this one because it's, it's just, again, still talking about the complication rates and how it, it would be if you're doing two anastomoses, you're going to see a higher instance of complication. It's still not super high, though. I mean, 11% uh, complication rate with no 90-day mortality. Um, I think this, when we're treating severe obesity, it's still uh, a, a, a good option. I put this in because um, to show you that that... Yes, the duodenal switch group had more diarrhea, more uh, issues, uh, and including uh, with anal leakage. Um, but overall, the, um, they were able to get in more protein than the bypass patient. Uh, and one thing to consider when you're taking care of DS patients is that you do need to manage their GI symptoms. And one of the reasons I said I was surprised about the duodenal ileal stenosis is this is a great study looking at the buffering effect of the duodenal bulb and how in these patients you could see the pH was less. So they thought that could explain why there was a lower instance of stoma ulcers. And as well, I, I extrapolated that to mean uh, uh, stenosis. This was a hepatic complication post-DS. When I talked about duodenal switch early on in my career, there were a few articles out there talking about liver failure after DS because of severe uh, malnutrition. And so um, this is something that they're seeing more um, in the literature. And it was uh, predominantly with BPD uh, and DS patients. So this is something you need to uh, be aware of, which is why I take um, blood, blood levels twice a year. And it's a combo of protein calorie malnutrition, bacterial overgoat, um, genetic background, as well as lipotoxicity. DVT is pretty, um, is, is comparable to what we'd expect with bypass and, and um, other procedures. It's always operative time, length of the hospital stay that were identified as risk factors. And in their study, when they looked at it, they didn't have any mortalities related to the thromboembolic disease. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can be high. Our standard, basically this paper is saying what we recommend for patients to take, which is about you know, 1,000 um, of vitamin D minimum a day or 1,200 is not enough. And I think we've upped this subsequently to 4,000, 4 to 5,000 5, for vitamin D a day. Um, but that secondary hyperparathyroidism was still present even when the patients were on uh, the appropriate dosage. And um, it improved the vitamin D levels, but not the secondary hyperparathyroidism. So vitamin D deficiency after adrenal switch is a problem. And this study looked at 20 patients, and I don't even know how to order 600,000 uh, of uh, vitamin D, but they were able to give it to this group. And what was really stunning is that the patients that received the super high dose of uh, colocalciferol had persistent elevation and maintenance of their vitamin D uh, for over six months and that their parathyroid hormone normalized. So even if you walk away with one thing, if you can get a hold of this dose, you're able to give it to your patients with severe vitamin D deficiency, it may uh, completely help them. Vitamin K is another. I have all my patients that I do SADI or DS on with um, uh, ADEC vitamins, ADEK. Uh, vitamin K may not, uh, can be low, may not actually show an issue, and they felt that that's really because of the vitamin K2 production in the colon, but they were able to supplement and improve um, for these patients. Weird things that can occur. This is a case report of what happens if you have severe vitamin A deficiency and develop uh, conjunctival keratopathy, keratopathy, excuse me. And um, these, this, the, they actually both got better, unbelievable. Um, so just something to be aware of. And then this is uh, what um, Shanita was talking about, the wet berry berry uh, with had uh, resolution with um, uh, supplementation with thiamine and the other elements. So I may not have convinced you because I showed you the weird stuff, but in general, I think most of the complications you're going to see are related to perioperative in terms of bleeding, leak, and DVT, DVT are what we're going to see with bypass and sleeve. Um, Long-term, SADS does have less complications with BPDDS, and the majority of patients um, 
have nutritional deficiencies despite the supplementation, which is why it's important to uh, check their levels more than once a year. And our dosing may not adequately treat the DS patients, uh, and which is why we, I think the new guidelines come closer. And then just to be aware that if they do have protein malnutrition for a long time, it can develop into some serious hepatic uh, issues with failure. And that most of the revisions for this are either uh, for severe malnutrition or diarrhea, but there's still not that many. It's about, you know, if you add it, it's about 1.5% uh, revision rate. Thank you.